um, this is going to be called, this is the, the new book, basically, The New Covenant of Damascus. Uh, it's the Damascus document, uh, the community rule, 4Q instruction, and then a handful of other documents that all kind of talk about the same thing. They very easily could be all pieces of the same document. And so putting those together, uh, <coughs> we've seen several interesting things uh, that parallel a lot of the teachings in the New Testament. This is not so much prophetic like some of the others are, but doctrinal. So it tells you the history and belief system of the Essenes and things like that. So very, very fascinating work. But today what I wanted to do is go through these documents and pull out uh, the what they say about this book called the Book of Hagi. And we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. So basically, um, we have all these translations, the Damascus Covenant, or document rather, community rule, 4Q instruction, which are these, uh, 4Q 415 through 18, uh, 23, and then 1Q 26. And then there's some other things and some teachings about the teacher of righteousness, who he is in the scrolls, how the Messiah fits in. Uh, book of Time Divisions is a prophetic book. And then the Book of Hagi. And then there's some other things that kind of fill in the gaps. So first off, what we want to do is just go through and we'll look at this. Let me do a scan for uh, Hagi. And we'll just go through all of these. And so... Um, Okay, so in the first part of this, which is, let's see where we're at here, in the Damascus Covenant, uh, 19, there's a qualification for Zadok judges. And what we're doing here is we're going through sh uh, showing the order. So just kind of remember the way it worked is there were Sadducees, there was Pharisees, there were followers of the way, which are the Zadok priests or the Essenes. Uh, there were... Um, Samaritans, Herodians, and uh, several other subgroups. But the main ones are the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. And uh, a lot of interesting things on the, the history for that. But they had their own order. Their story is that they are original Judaism. And the Pharisees and Sadducees are breakoffs or cults, if you will. And we would probably agree with that just looking at the Sadducees. If the Sadducees didn't believe in life after death, didn't believe in spirits or anything like that, then they're not believers at all, no matter how you look at it, and should not be ruling Israel. Pharisees, on the other hand, basically believed that stuff, but didn't believe in uh, the Messiah properly, whereas the Essenes did. So they basically would pair these off. They had different names for different subgroups. So the... Um, Pharisees were called the sons of darkness, which is the easiest because they started using the lunar calendar system as opposed to the biblical uh, solar one, according to the Essenes. The Sadducees were called the seekers of smooth things, and that's actually from a uh, prophecy out of Isaiah. The idea that a, a pebble at the bottom of the stream, when the water goes over it all the time for years and years, it becomes very smooth. And so it doesn't get carried away with the water. So the concept is when problems come with life, just side with whoever would benefit you the most and go that direction. So Sadducees fit perfectly because if you, if Rome is ruling or the Silurian kingdom or, you know, Greeks or whomever, just go with the flow, do what you're told because we're going to die anyway and there's no life after death. So forget about it. Um, and that's, that concept of a scene. So being smooth like that, there's no resistance. They're the first ones to forsake the country and turn it over to an invading power. Um, you can see a lot of parallels in our country uh, in the scenes and things like that. We won't go there. But the point is, we're going to see in this is that the Zadok priests uh, love the scriptures uh, if you're going to run a, we're going to see here in a little bit, a church, like maybe I have a church home uh, with at least 10 people, then they would consider that a small synagogue. So me and the people that study with me, if I was the pastor, you come over to my house church or 
maybe we actually have a full church building, have a few hundred people, but when we have at least 10, it should be structured in a certain way. There should be someone who's the overseer, which is bishop, you know, or the pastor, and that pastor should be skilled in the Bible. Now, their version of the Bible, of course, is just the Old Testament, and they don't add to it. So it's the same Old Testament that the Protestants have, just the 39 books, no more, uh, because there are prophecies that that's where it's supposed to be sealed at. On the flip side of that, they also have extra biblical books that they study, but they want to differentiate the whole concept of the ruling guide of faith is the Bible. Now, as Christians, we would actually add the New Covenant to that, the New Testament, which is prophesied by them to occur, but their documents are not part of the Old or the New Covenant. So anyway, he's supposed to know the history, the morality, how to properly interpret it, how to know things like that, and then be an expert in Bible prophecy and the, the writings from the school of the prophets that are not in the, in the Bible. And that together shows him the time periods and what you're supposed to do. So for instance, if we lived in a time where there was no opposition to Christianity at all, then I'd say, let's go door to door. Let's go out in the park and stand up and preach. And you don't need permits. You just go do stuff and see what happens. When you get to a place where you have to have permits, permits and you can't say certain things a certain way, then it gets much tougher. And if you live in a country where it's flat out illegal, then it's even tougher yet. There are times of darkness, as they say, where you can't preach the gospel. Even Jesus said this, it's like preach while there's light, because there's a time that the darkness is coming when no man can work. And so it's that kind of a concept. So the rule is the pastor is supposed to be skilled in the Bible. Absolutely. Second to that is all the prophecies. Not that they're any less important. Prophecies are very important or you get yourself killed. You got to understand them properly. But then third to that is this book of Hagi. And uh, one of the scripts we're going to look at tonight, it says that if that's too much, and that really is an awful lot, it's, it's like uh, being the sole pastor, so, you know, uh, of a church and having a full-time job uh, during the day, and then maybe working on weekends or evenings also. It'd be like, you really can't do that. You're going to burn yourself out. So you can't have three or four or five jobs and really get anywhere. So the concept is the, the, the book of Hagi, whatever it is, can be handed off to someone else as long as it's under the pastor's authority. So much like I can't be in, in two places on, on Monday nights, right? So maybe I have a couple people and I teach them. And then on Monday nights, they go to two different places and teach. So something like that. So it's under that authority. So we know what the scriptures are. We know what the, um, the, the school of the prophets is. And we have some of their writings. And we're working on that, trying to recreate all the prophetic teachings. But in addition, somebody, as long as you have a group of 10 people or more, should be skilled in Hagi and should be running it, whatever it is. So that's the question. What is it? Sometimes it's call, uh, called the book of meditation, um, all sorts of different ideas, and nobody really knows what it is. Now, you might look at this and say, well, H-A-G-A-I is Haggai, and that's the name of a prophet. And it's actually um, a K-H sound rather than an H. So it's not related to that at all. So, but let's look at this. So qualification of a Zadok judge. So if we were back in the time period under the authority of the real priests of Israel, they would be the ones to pass judgment, not the Pharisees or the Sadducees. But this is what it says. This is the rule for the judges in the congregation. At the proper time, 10 men shall be chosen from the congregation four from the tribe of Levi and Aaron, and six from Israel. So the majority needs to be those that study scripture. Okay, and so that makes sense. They are to be well-versed in the book of Hagi. It's got something to do with judging. Now, we think of a judge as somebody that I'm going to look at you, think about it, and figure out how to punish you for a crime, you know. And that's a type of judge also, but a judge is anybody that makes a judgment call. 
Should I reward you or just let you go? Should I punish you or just let you go? Or maybe a, a doctor would practice medicine, for instance. He would look at you, listen to the symptoms, think about what the symptoms might be, ask you some questions, make a judgment, which they would call a diagnosis, and then go forward. So it could be any kind of judgment. It could be a prophecy guy, like a prophet, saying, okay, the prophecies were so many years after this, and give me a calendar. Okay, that's okay. So we're getting close. If we're getting close, this should start happening, and he's figuring things out or making judgments. So it could be a bunch of different things. But judges in general, and there's probably all those kind of judges in each congregation. But you should be well-versed, or some of the judges at least, should be well-versed in Hagi. Now notice what it says, in Hagi and in the foundation ordinances of the covenant. Now just think about, for instance, say you and I go to the same church, just say we're a Southern Baptist church or something, or an assembly of God or whatever. Uh, a normal Christian Protestant denomination is going to be going by the Bible, the Old and New Testament, and that is the ruling guide of faith. That's the Bible. Okay. Second to the Bible, we're going to have something called a, uh, um, yeah, my mind glitches. What do you call that in a Baptist church? Um, the, the papers of incorporation and uh, your doctrinal statement, that kind of stuff. So as a Baptist, I believe in this and not that. And maybe that's right or maybe it's wrong, but that's what that denomination believes. Okay, so you've got the Bible that we all agree on. And then as each group interprets it slightly different, we have doctrinal positions. So you get a Calvinist church and a Pentecostal church and a, a Catholic church and, a, you know, and they do things differently. So in this case, he's supposed to be versed in the foundations or the ordinances of the covenant. So that would be their doctrinal statement. That's basically what we're reading here in this book, the community rule and Damascus covenant. So you need to understand that. So proper doctrine. So for any, any uh, moral issue, say like homosexuality or abortion or whatever, whatever we're talking about, you go to one church and they say that's good. You go to another church and they say that's bad. That's their doctrinal position. So we're saying here to be, they're, they're saying to be a good Jewish person, you don't follow the teachings, the tradition of the elders. And you don't do it like the scribes do it and definitely don't do it like the don't even associate with the the sadducees the zealots the sakari those guys but hang out with real believers and real believers believers go by this code of morality and prophecy and stuff so uh these judges then are to be well versed not only in scripture but in the book of Hagi and in the ordinances of their covenant Okay, so this is the ordinances of the covenant. We're still trying to figure out what Hagi is. And they have to be between the ages of 25 and 60. No one above the age of 60 shall judge the congregation. Um, you, you can go be a good Bible teacher. Um, as you know, sometimes I'll misspeak. I might say something like Noah brought the Ten Commandments down from Mount Sinai. And I mean to say Moses, but I slip and say Noah. Well, that's not a big deal. You guys can catch me on that. And, but if I'm not understanding properly and I'm judging a capital case, no, I have to be super sharp. So the, the cutoff is 60. No one above the age of 60 shall judge the congregation. Adam's fall caused our lifespans to be shortened. And when the wrath of God came against the inhabitants of the earth, he commanded their knowledge to depart before their life ended. So the vast majority of people get a little, um, not really dementia or anything, but just aren't quite as sharp as they were when they were older. They forget things. You know, like I, I, I'm beginning to do that too, but I'm told that like Alzheimer's and dementia is a permanent memory loss. So I have no clue now what it is we were talking about. I never will remember it if it's dementia. So if I can go, wait a minute, what was that? The guy's name we went to high school with or whatever. And I think about it and I think about it and eventually, ah, I remember now it was this. 
Well, if I can pull it out eventually, it's not Alzheimer's or dementia. It's not a permanent memory loss. So that's good old fashioned being old. So uh, I'm, I'm there now. So, but anyway, and there's things you can do to kind of help that, but we'll talk about that later. But uh, that's pretty interesting here. So the concept that people in general misjudge, misspeak, can't remember things when they get really old. So to make sure that 60 is not really old for them at all, but that's the cutoff part. And remember, Josephus talked about how Essenes were healers, um, uh, 100% accurate in their prophecies, and they lived, their normal lifespan was 110 to 120. So somewhere in that neighborhood. The average Gentile, from what I were told back in, in Jesus' day, was about 60. So the average um, Pharisee, Sadducee, living an easy life, probably eating kosher, stuff like that, was a 70 to 80-ish. So kind of like what we are. We're not out really hurting our, our body, working hard, getting shot at. You know, we're not Roman soldiers or whatever. So 70, 80 is probably average for an American. But they consistently went way past 100. So, but... To be sure, 25, you don't want a young person who has hot-tempered, that has no experience being a judge either. So 25 to 60. Okay, so let's go on. Next time, Hagi is mentioned. Um, let's see here. Okay, so priestly laws for camp dwellers. This is interesting because they had two sets of the basic morality. Hmm, something clicked. The basic morality uh, applies to everybody. If it's right, it's right. And if it's wrong, it's wrong. So we all have to follow directions. But then there are other things that change depending on who you are, what you're doing, where you're at. And so they have a list of uh, how it's supposed to be done if you're a camp dweller. In other words, you dwell out away from the cities, in the country, in the Essene camps. Okay, so the priests and stuff would go by this. The city dwellers would be the people that followed a seen doctrine. They're not Pharisees or Sadducees, but they believe a seen doctrine. They're not priests. So they get married. They have kids. They have businesses. They work in the cities. They buy and trade and sell. And they have laws that don't apply to the other guys, you know, who maybe don't have kids or don't have businesses or whatever. So these are the laws for the camp dwellers. So the priests in that area. A priest is to be learned in the book of Hagi. He shall always, or the book of Hagi, in other words, shall always be present in a group of 10. Okay, so when you and I get together, even if it's one-on-one, -on -one, we should always have a Bible there, you know. And then if it's something where we're having a business meeting, do we really want the church to do this? Well, let's look up our bylaws, our foundational documents for our church. Uh, and so those are kind of important. But if we got a group of 10, we need to have those and the book of a key. Always, always, always to be present because it's important for some reason. Uh, he, the person, the priest or the person that's learned in the book of Hagi, it says, shall rule over the group. Now, why, why not just the scriptures, you know, doctrinal stuff? So if you come in and you say, there's this new book, this new movement at this church, and it's this is what they do, and the pastor can, I, maybe I can look at it and say, uh, that's going to amount to no good. We're not doing that here. So, but that's the guy, and I would be judging that by the Old and the New Testament, not Hagi. So what is Hagi? If the priest is not an expert in all of these, and that would be, of course, the, in the group of 10. So it's the Old Testament, the foundation documents, and Hagi. If the priest is not an expert in all of those, but a Levite in the group is, the lot shall be that everyone going to and from the camp, coming from or going to, shall be under the Levite's control. So the pastor kind of is doing the sermons and teaching the prophecy in the foundational core but there's a deacon or something that decides who gets to come in. Now, your first thought of that is like, well, in case it's a spy, we don't have that necessarily in America because nobody cares, 
But what if we were in a very dictatorship type country and they figure out we're having a house church, they're going to come in and kill us. So somebody needs to be organizing that. So is that what we're talking about or no? For some reason, it's important that we know who's coming in and going out the door. And that could be disease. It could be spies. It could be other things. But so the pastor needs to be an expert in the doctrine, our foundation uh, teachings, the Bible, prophecy, and that's probably enough. Somebody else can do the Hagi part. And whoever is learned in Hagi is the one who decides who goes in and comes out. So that's our first clue. And then qualifications of the priest and the overseer. Overseer is like bishop. We see that in the, New, in the King James. A priest who is appointed to preside over the multitude must be at least or must be between 30 and 60 years old, well versed in the book of Hagi, and in all the regulations of Torah. Okay, so notice that the regulations of Torah would be the Old Testament. So the Old Testament is not Hagi, it's not another word for the Old Testament. So you got to know Hagi and you got to know the Old Testament or the Bible. Okay and teaching them properly. You have to know both of these. They're different. New Testament hasn't been written, so there's no way we could say Hagi is the New Testament. Um, if anything, that would be the foundation of the, of the rules of the or order, which is what this is. The overseer of all the camps must be between 30 and 50 years old, master of every secret of man and of every tongue. In any matter, one who wished to bring before the congregation, let him address the overseer concerning any dispute of law. So these guys, these are like regular judges, among other things. But if there's a dispute about law, that's why you have to understand all the regulations of Torah and then whatever this is. Okay, now here's another place where it talks about it. The vision of Hagi and the book of memorial. There's two separate books here. He gave these as an inheritance to spiritual people, believers, because they are holy. He did not give Hagi to the spirit of flesh because they were not able to discern between good and evil with judgment of spirit. So if I'm an expert in this Hagi book, apparently I can help a lot of people. But if I'm evil, I can probably use it to hurt a lot of people. So you look at that and you think, well, that's not prophecy. I mean, I could say the rapture is happening tomorrow or the Antichrist is here and scare people. But in the long run, it didn't really do anything, hurt anybody. The information contained in Hagi, I could really hurt somebody with it. Or if I knew what I was doing was godly, I could really help people with it. What in the world would that be? Okay, so. Here is the chapter. Those are just the, the, the clues for it. So here's where we pull it together in the back of the book. We've got a whole chapter on Hagi. So let me just read this to you. This mysterious book of Hagi is mentioned numerous times in the scrolls, not just in these, it's in others also. But it, first off, it can't be confused with the minor prophet Haggai. Okay, so Haggai is actually like a C-H, Haggai, and this is ha and it's E instead of uh, I. So it's Hagi as opposed to Hagai. So it's a totally different word. Some refer to this as the book of meditation. And the reason they do that is because the Hebrew for this particular word, you can see it right here, H-H-G-Y. Uh, so uh, when you tack an H onto the front of a word in Hebrew, it means the something. So like Mashiach is Messiah, Hamashiach the Messiah. So this is Ha Hagi. So it's the Hagi, whatever Hagi is. So the H-G-Y. So the closest biblical Hebrew word, it doesn't have to be a biblical Hebrew word, but the closest one in the Bible is Haguth, which means meditation or deep study. So this is a clue. I mean, meditation is not the Eastern version of blanking out the mind. Meditation is contemplation, is study, it's trying to figure something out, 
and then ah i got an idea let's try this so you're doing you're figuring something out uh it's strong's number h1900 the root word is haga which means to remove or to drive out and it's uh strong's hebrew word 1898 if you want to look those up so here's the with that in mind here's a pulling together what the Damascus document says. It states that a Zadok priest is to be an expert in the Torah. Okay, we covered that. And in the regulations of the covenant, the foundations of the covenant, the book of time divisions, that's the prophecy book uh, that they had. So prophecy in general. And we know a little bit about time divisions. We have a little bit of that in the book too. But And in the many subjects of the book of Hagi. Okay. So think about this then. So if these are the four things that a pastor or a priest or whatever has to be understand, then the book of time divisions is not the Torah. The book of Hagi is not the Torah. Uh, the regulations of the covenant go beyond Torah. It's what we do now. It's like our rule and guide of faith or the, the Baptist code, you know, as opposed to the Bible. So these are four separate things. Torah prophecy uh regulations and hagi okay so then if a priest is not well versed in the book of hagi so a priest comes along he's technically over everybody so he knows about prophecy and torah and the regulations of the covenant so he's govern you the the Essene way but the last part he's not well versed in hagi he may appoint a Levite to be an expert and rule over a particular camp with it. So Hagi doesn't give you the ability to tell people what they can and cannot do. But in our group, like our group of 10 people here in the house, he's the guy that lets them go in and out of the house. So he's ruling over a particular type of people or, or a small group of people. So the priest who's actually supposed to be over everything can appoint a Levite who's an expert in it to rule over a particular camp with it. However, if there is a problem with leprosy, the priest must get must uh, have the the Levite rather must have the high priest sign off on his diagnosis before treating the person who has the disease. So because of the way the law is in Torah. The priest and only the priest can say, yep, you've got leprosy, all right. Therefore, I, whatever, treat you or banish you or whatever they do with leprosy. So what this is saying is there's a guy, because the priest is busy and doesn't understand all the little things, all the many things of Hagi. This Levite then takes over that responsibility. He watches people that goes in and comes out. If one of them has leprosy, that's a little different than all the other reasons of, of making someone not leave or not come in. And that particular one, he's got to get the priest to sign off on it. Does that make sense? So he's got to come over and say, okay, this is not a cold. This is not an allergy. See how the skin looks. See how the white and the, and the pus and you see this and everything. That is leprosy. Okay, so I need you to sign off on this. And the, high, the priest might look at it and say, I don't know that from a rash, but you tell me it's leprosy. Okay, fine. But he has to be the one to make the decision. So at this point, if you think about it, it's got to be some sort of herbal medicine book. So the person ruling this um, gets to tell who, who gets to come into the house and who gets to leave. Um, are you well enough to go to, you know, and take care of all that? But if it's the one main thing that they had problems with, which is leprosy, then the priest has to be involved. So that makes sense. Um, how many of us could be herbal doctors and prophecy experts and run a, a church and be a pastor, you know, and be on the board? And it, that is asking an awful lot. So you can kind of see that. And all the religious stuff and the prophecy stuff, it doesn't change. Once you learn it, What's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. And all I got to do is look at you and say, ah, you shouldn't do that or you should do it this way. That's how we do stuff. I don't really have to make many decisions. It's just you, you either 
shook my hand or you slapped me. It's easy. I can tell what to do. But now when it comes to I feel sick and I look a little weird, that's always going to be different depending on what virus is going around or that's a whole job by itself, herbal medicine or a doctor of any kind. Okay, so with that in mind, we'll look at this. Uh, the book of Hagi is not Torah, okay? It's not the regulations of the Zadok order, and it's not the prophetic book of time divisions. So it's, it's one of the four, and it's not any of those. So if it's got nothing to do with scripture, except on this one kind when scripture says if it's uh, leprosy, then it's a, but anything else, it's got nothing to do with scripture or the regulations of the order or the prophecies. So whoever rules the camp must know it well enough, all of its many subjects, which include the treatment for leprosy, but he has to be able to use it to study or meditate on or diagnose, drive out or remove problems. Okay. So it's not like who's causing the problem. Who can I excommunicate from the church? Not that kind of a problem. It's more of a leprosy type problem. So it's most likely the Essene herbal medicine book. If this is correct, the book of Hagi would be translated book of cures or the book of removings or driving outs, that kind of stuff. We're removing and driving out the disease or the evil spirit or whatever. Okay. So the scrolls often mention that Enoch, Noah, and Shem had herbal medicine books. And this is all through the different the scrolls, many of them. One of the herbal medicine books had a list of various plants for specific remedies based on what would go, what would grow best in the environment th that you have. So, for instance, we were told that Enoch's uh, book would be like this. So suppose you have a certain problem. And this this um, plant, this plant and this plant would all work for you. This is the best. We're going to call that number one, number two, and then number three, you'd have to take a lot of it, but it would help also. So we'd really want to be number one, but it doesn't grow here in Kansas. Okay. Well, what does number two? Not really. Number three. Yeah, we can get that to grow. Back in these days, you, you couldn't really ship anything quick. And if you got the, the plant, made the powder and then tried to ship it, good chance it wouldn't be useful by the, t the months later by the time you get it through the caravans so you really have to grow your own so if you're at a beach or high up in a mountain in a tropical forest or in the desert you're going to have to figure out you got to do the best with what you have now today we can find out the best and order it from amazon right if it's legal in our country or whatever whatever herbs vitamins whatever so, but it's interesting that they had that written. Now, here's a quote from Jubilees, chapter 10. Um, the angel is talking. One of us, he commanded that we should teach Noah all their medicines. For he knew that we would, that they would not walk in uprightness, nor strive in righteousness. We explained to Noah all the medicines and their diseases, together with their seductions, how he might heal them with herbs of the earth. Noah wrote these things down in a book, Hagi, which instructed him concerning every kind of medicine. And thus the evil spirits were precluded from hurting the sons of Noah. It's not that demons make you sick, but demons can do weird stuff and you can get injured. And um, uh, there's sorcery, which is using certain herbs and certain herbs that cause you to connect with the demonic also give hallucinations which also cause problems. So it's all kind of related. And he gave uh, all of them that he had written to Shem, his oldest son, for he loved him exceedingly above all of his sons. So notice first it's seductions. Remember back when it said that the book of Hagi was given to the wise but and, and the righteous, but not the people of flesh, because... In context, it looked like I could use this book to really help people. But if I was evil, I could use it to really hurt. Well, think about that. If you're sick and I mix up a potion and I give it to you and it cures you because it's strong medicine. 
What if I give that same thing to somebody who's not sick? Or maybe on purpose, put it in their food to kill them, poison them. And that's one of the definitions of pharmakia as a poisoner in some of the texts. So herbal medicine, if it's not a placebo, if it actually does something and you take too much, you're going to hurt yourself with it. But if you have the right ailment and you take it, it'll fix you. So you can understand that why you don't want evil people playing around with drugs or medications or whatever. Okay, here's another quote from Testaments of the Patriarchs. This says that the Book of Jubilees, uh, okay, this is all a bit put together. The Book of Jubilees mentions the herbal medicine books of Noah and Shem. We just saw that. The books of Noah's fathers, which is in chapter 12, and then the books of Enoch, Noah, and the forefathers, and then the book of Amram, uh, so all that together. In Jubilees 45, it states that Jacob gave all of these books of the fathers to Levi. So Levi, when he started the Levitical priesthood, had all of these books. So Enoch, Noah, the herbal medicine books for sure, other books probably called the books of the fathers. So these were all passed down. So if this is true, and angels taught Noah, Noah taught Shem, Shem taught Eber, and it was in the school of the prophets. So you've got the Old Testament stuff, not the Old Testament, but the pre-Old Testament historical stuff, the writings of the, of the prophets, pre-Old Testament prophets, that is, and then herbal medicine. That's pretty much the whole school. So here's what it goes on just to say. There's a couple of other points here. The Book of Jubilees also predicts that toward the end of time, the uh, 75 would be considered old age. And that sounds funny when everybody's living to 120, 75. That's not old age. And then in Jubilees 23 says that the average lifespan in some places actually drops under 70. We see that today. A lot of people don't live to 70. Some people live considerably more, but 70, 80-ish is probably the average lifespan of a lot of people. Lifespans decrease, it says, because of the wickedness of the age. So if everybody's greedy and is doing GMO and experimentation and, and stuff that they shouldn't be, the food sources and the air and stuff is getting to where they're not the way they used to be, because of greed or wickedness, lifespans could be shortened, is what it's saying. And I think we're kind of experiencing some of this. I think our lifespans went way down, and then modern medicine has brought it back up. But if modern medicine becomes pharmakia, for instance, becomes, um, they start doing things that they shouldn't, which according to the old text, it goes back to Nephilim theology. So the whole concept of altering your genes for some reason, or your genetic code, that's the big no-no that you don't want to try to do. So something happens. And it's because of the wickedness of the age. I would consider that greed. Or maybe a country develops a certain virus that only attacks certain people. And so they release it over, you know, to try to get, I don't know how that would work, but something like this occurs according to this. This wickedness also produces, so the lifespans are shortened. And at two of the ways that it's kind of shortened, according to this document, is an unnatural type of memory loss, kind of like Alzheimer's, and an unnatural type of obesity, like torpor. So it's normal that when I get older, I get a big belly, and I tend to forget stuff. It takes me a while to remember things. But for it to be totally gone... And for me, maybe I don't even overeat, but I just swell up or have some sort of a problem because of what I'm eating, not eat necessarily all I'm, I'm not, not, it's possible that I'm not fat, like just being fat and I'm not forgetful just because I'm old, but this is an unnatural kind. I thought this was interesting. I was reading a book by um, uh, Joe Horn from Skywatch and he was talking about the problems he's had with his health. And in one part of the book, he made this comment. I went and looked it up, but it's interesting that obesity 
is one of the main causes of death in the USA. But recently, a new medical term has come about called, and it's a phrase, it's called metabolically obese at normal weight. And it's abbreviated M-O-N-W. So what we're saying is when you get obese, really fat, the reason that it kills you is because the excessive weight causes all these chemical reactions, right? So it's possible that you could be skinny, which means none of that would happen, but something you're eating, breathing, taking in is causing those same chemical reactions, even though you're skinny. So yes, being obese is dangerous, but the wrong kind of food or poisons or chemicals or whatever apparently is causing the same kind of a problem. And so it's interesting to see Jubilees beginning to come to pass. Okay, so let's see here. And the ancient apocalypse of Ezra actually mentions something like this. It talks about a change in the air. So again, um, you know, we've I remember a decade or two back, they talked about acid rain. The idea that you don't want to catch just fresh rainwater and drink it because it's going to have pollutants in the atmosphere. I don't know how serious that is if you're living out in the country, out in Montana or somewhere, but whatever. But something like that happens, a change in the air. So let's go ahead and finish this then. According to the scrolls, the siege had an average life of 110 to 120 years and maintained good health until their death. So the average is seen wasn't bedridden the last 10 years of their life. They didn't suffer strokes. They didn't suffer heart attacks, or maybe some of them did, but the average, they maintained a good, I'm sure they slowed down, but they were, they understood, they walked around, they did the things, that kind of stuff. In this book, in the history section, we, we talk about um, Menachem, and I think we talked about that a week or so back. Uh, the fact that he could be in a scene back in the time of Herod the Great, outlive him. And then uh, the Apostle Paul, some 60 years later, uh, was blessed by Menachem and the other two guys and put into ministry. Well, you're thinking 60, he'd have to be at least 90 years old, and most people don't live that long. Well, a scene's at 110, he's only 90. Yeah, no problem. But he went all the way from Antioch all the way down to Jerusalem. I'm sure he didn't walk it. I'm sure he rode something. But still, that's pretty cool. A 90-year-old deciding I'm going to get on my horse and take a trip and I'll be back next month. And, you know, so, but it's entirely possible. Um, let's see here. So the average Gentile lived to be about 60. The average Ph Pharisees and Sadducees seemed to be 70 to 80. That, again, could be because they had an easy life. It could be possibly the kosher food being better, slightly better than the Gentile food or whatever. But whatever it is, it wasn't as good as the Essenes. And the Essenes ate kosher. So the food is the same. Gentiles probably have gross food. Who knows? But there's something there. And they reckon this to be with the herbal medicine books. Um. Now, here's an interesting, interesting quote. Hippolytus says in his refutation of Heresies 921, the Essenes that kept the way of the ancients, uh, you know, you just go ask them, why is it you guys live longer than the rest of everybody? They attributed their long life to extreme devotion to religion. They were very, very serious believers. So you don't do drugs, you don't fornicate, you don't, you know, do all these things that can really mess you up. You don't get drunk every night. You, you know, and our medical establishment, no matter who you look, if it's uh, doctors, surgeons, herbal medicine guys, trainers, bodybuilders, no matter who, they all say the same thing in a certain way. They say, stop the, the excessive drinking, stop the smoking, don't be overweight, and get some form of exercise. You can't just sit all day at a chair. So you got to get up and move around. So those four things everybody agrees on. So um, extreme devotion to religion, their condemnation of all excess in regard to what is served up, food in other words. So they're, they're skinny. 
um, or at least not overweight. I have no idea what they considered to be overweight. So we're still trying to figure that out. Um, and for being temperate and incapable of anger. So I'm, I'm thinking not just anger, but this whole concept of extreme emotion. If you're always upset, if you're always depressed, if you're always angry, if you're always worried, that's going to cause an effect on your chemistry. So very interesting. Intermittent fasting. Uh, fasting generally resets the body, and we don't need to reset this necessarily, but um, they had breakfast, according to the scrolls, at 11 a.m. So basically, they skipped breakfast. So if they ate 6, 7 o'clock at night, something like that, that was their last meal, and they don't eat till 11, if that was their normal routine, um, that amounts to a really good set of intermittent fasting. And that's supposed to be work wonders on your body from what they say. Um, and in 4Q instruction, one of the other scrolls in the book, everything happens by his word. So eat what he gives you, but no more, least you shorten your life. So you're not supposed to be obese. And in connection with that, the intermittent fasting. And there's other stuff in here, like the, the location and the sun and the different things that might do that supplements with your diets and then uh, 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 fermentation I think I think is one of the keys let me just stop here with this one but with the adding supplements to your diet the whole concept is we know that John uh, the apostle was in a scene uh, but the basic idea is you eat what's set before you and don't ask questions you know whether it's sacrificed to a pagan guy or whatever just just eat it preach the gospel go on so john would go plant churches and i'm sure he would sit there and eat the junk food with the guys because that's just the way it, it worked but he still lived to be around 110 120 years old like the regular essenes so and the point is in this thing you know that if you ate really well and got to say 50 and then ate nothing but junk food you'd shorten your lifespan and the concept is if I ate junk food all the way up to 20 or 30 and then decided to start eating really good food, I'd probably maybe not live quite as long as I would if I would have ate good all the time, but it'd make a difference in my health. So if John could eat the junk food, how is it he continued to live the lifespan of an Essene? Well, the only logical thing is in addition to the junk food, he took supplements. So these are herbal medicine stuff. And so that's what we want to focus on. Um, and then this is a thing about fermentation foods. So stuff like sauerkraut and yogurt is supposed to be really good for you. But they had a type of way that they would ferment their vitamins and their things to make it last longer. So for instance, right here, this last part, uh, you may not know this, but penicillin is for a fermented form of mold. You take a certain kind of mold. That's why I can't take it because I'm allergic to mold, but it's a fermented type. Uh, mold is very bad for us, but penicillin has saved a lot of people's lives. Natto is a fermented form of soybean. Soybean is not supposed to be good for guys to eat, you know, just because of testosterone and estrogen and all that stuff. Not that it's bad, but it's not good. However, fermented soy gives you natto, and that actually does a lot of things for your heart and your lungs and very, very good medicine. Um, other types of fermented foods, ivermectin, serapeptase, necokinase, things like that that are being experimented with and, and that. I have had fantastic results with the serapeptase. My son has, um, and I'm not trying to sell anything here, and maybe I shouldn't mention it on YouTube, but anyway, there are doctors that do this, so it should be okay. But my son has had um, um, rheumatoid arthritis in his back for quite a while. Yeah, I gave him some serapeptase because it's supposed to be good to clear out the sinuses. It's just a very strong anti-inflammatory. Well, it does a lot of other stuff too. But So he took it for that reason. And after two or three hours, he noticed his sinuses were better. But then he got up to do something and realized he had no back pain and gave it to a lady at his church that had rheumatoid arthritis or some kind of arthritis she had the same result 
and I gave it to another lady at our church and no change. You know, so it all depends on why and what it is and things like that. So, and then, you know, this here, we're not really supposed to talk about online, I guess, from what I understand, but it's a fermented type of something. And apparently it does really good with something. So anyway, I'm going to try to pull these together. Hopefully they'll let me talk about this kind of stuff. I'm not trying to be pro or anti anything. I'm just trying to find out what they did with the scrolls. Okay, so if they say eight potatoes, let's eat potatoes. If they say potatoes are bad, let's not eat potatoes. So this kind of thing. Um, it would be fantastic if all of us, instead of dying at 80, could die at 120. And that sounds ridiculous, but some of these, specifically the serapeptase and the necokinase, um, now that we know what they are, the enzymes that those things are, they're in food that the Japanese eat a lot of. And Japanese in general uh, have a much higher lifespan than a lot of us. The kids now are having the same lifespan because they don't eat this stuff. They eat the McDonald's and just like we do, you know. But from what I was looking at online, there's one of the doctors online that was doing a study. And he was saying that in Japan, uh, as, a, as a group, uh, in the area of Japan, they have per capita the highest number of people who live past 100 than anywhere else on the planet. And then in um, right south of there, I think it was Okinawa, one of the islands or whatever, um, they have the highest capita, um, or a group of people per capita, uh, that live past 110. And I wasn't aware that there was anybody these days that lived past 110. Well, I'm sure there's one or two, but that's interesting. If um, the majority of people that eat like we do have the same lifespan, and some of these guys, and they, some of it could be genetics, but you look at the kind of food they have, and the kind of food they have is filled with some of these fermented type stuff. So just FYI, I'm trying to experiment with it, figure out things, and so we'll go forward. But if the same basic idea is what the Essenes did, and we don't, and I don't have a, a list of medicines. Uh, I have a list of um, a lot of script uh, manuscripts that talk about the list of medicines, but I don't have a single uh, manuscript from the Dead Sea Scrolls itself that will sell, you know, lettuce, tomato, you know, have a list of something. But knowing that they did this fermenting process and seeing now when we ferment certain things, what kind of things happen, it's getting really interesting. But I just wanted to share that with you. So.